even with the advanced engine designs of today, there are only really four factors that we need to consider when we're diagnosing an engine drivability concern. The first, of course, are we getting the right amount of fuel to match the amount of air taken in by the engine? And is every cylinder getting the same amount of air fuel mixture? Number two is related to the ignition system. Are we igniting that air fuel mixture efficiently and at the right time? Number three kind of relates just to the air. Are we able to seal the combustion chamber and compress that air charge so we can get a good efficient combustion process and harness the power released from that process? And number four, can the engine breathe? Can we get the air we need in and can we get it back out again? Many GDI engines suffer from carbon buildup in their intake tracks, and this certainly affects how well the engine can breathe. Testing for an engine's ability to breathe and what to do about it if there's a problem is today's subject on the trainer. Today's episode of The Trainer is brought to you by Autel. Be sure to see the entire line of diagnostic tools offered at www.autel.com. While gasoline direct injection may be a technology that's relatively new to you, it's not new technology. The first GDI engine to reach production was introduced in 1925 for a low compression truck engine. Several German cars use a Bosch mechanical GDI system in the 50s. However, it wasn't until Mitsubishi began using them for production cars beginning in 1996 that the technology began to become popular among the OEMs. Today, over half the vehicles being produced by the OEMs are GDI designs. As the name implies, GDI systems inject the fuel directly into the combustion chamber. As a result, GDI does not have the valve cleaning action that port injection provides when fuel is introduced to the engine upstream of the cylinder. This lack of a cleaning action can cause carbon deposits to build sooner in the intake tract and especially on the back of the intake valves, with some makes more prone to this issue than others. As the deposits accrue over time and mileage, the engine's ability to breathe can be affected. The carbon can also act as an insulator, preventing the valves from dispersing heat as they should and leading to their premature failure. It can also break off and fall into the engine, where it could lead to premature wear and tear of internal engine components. Carbon deposits may even flake off and pass through the combustion chamber and into the exhaust, this could lead to blockage of or even damage to the catalytic converter. If the engine is turbocharged, there's also a chance that the carbon could damage the turbine fins in the turbo. And in some instances, carbon that finds itself trapped between the piston and the cylinder wall can actually cause a condition known as low speed pre-ignition or LSPI. LSPI is an abnormal combustion event caused by the higher cylinder pressures common in turbocharged GDI engines running in low speed, high torque conditions. In these instances, the heated carbon debris can act as the source of ignition, altering timing and often resulting in piston damage. One contributor to carbon buildup is a vehicle that's used for short trips. In other words, the valves aren't getting hot enough to burn off the carbon deposits. Another factor, it seems, is vehicles that use a breather style ventilation system rather than a positive crankcase ventilation or PCV system tend to be more prone, it seems, to carbon buildup than the others. Some of the symptoms to watch for that could be related to carbon buildup include loss of power, especially when driving at higher speed poor acceleration, cold stalling, engine misfires, reduced fuel efficiency, a check engine light that's turned on, rough running, or engine judder at idle speed. 
There are a few methods that you can use to determine whether or not excessive carbon buildup is a suspect in the engine drivability concern that you're attempting to troubleshoot. Now, one of the first things, of course, to do is to ask the ECM or engine control module what it thinks. But I'm going to do that today in a way that's a little different than what you may be used to seeing me do. When I'm doing any kind of diagnostics uh, for an engine drivability complaint, whether the check engine light is on or not, I like to start here at Global OBD2. And there's a number of reasons for that. Very quickly, um, let me go ahead and select can, of course. Very quickly, any vehicle sold in the United States has to allow you access to any data related to emissions. That's nearly everything that the ECM does. The ECM, the engine control module, that's in charge of maintaining the emissions level to the standard the car was certified to. So it's checking all the systems on the vehicle to make sure that they stay in place. So I, of course I can access any codes that are in the engine control module. I can access related freeze frame. I can check the monitor status. Here is really even the more important one, live data. When we open up the live data, and you can see there's going to be a lot of data pits in here. The later model CAN vehicles just give you so much information. The beauty of this is you don't have to own a factory scan tool for every single nameplate that may show up in your shop. If it's for a drivability concern, if you have a global OBD2 capable scan tool, you can do exactly what I'm going to do here. And now I've got a whole bunch of stuff here. Again, we're looking for signs of carbon buildup engine how well the engine can breathe and there are two things that are going to tell me that calculated load and a little further down I'll show you absolute load I'm going to select those data pids and because this is a turbocharged vehicle I also want to take a look on any boost that may appear uh, during this test I'm going to show you well there's the absolute load so I want to select those and we'll keep coming down. Uh, we've got a boost pressure sensor, so we're going to go ahead and select that one as well. And now we're just going to show those. Here's a little tip. If you want the data refresh rate to be as fast as possible, only select the data PIDs that you need for the diagnostic process or diagnostic test that you're doing. No need for any of those other th at this point in time. I just want to see these. And I'm also going to graph a couple. I'm going to uh, graph all the information here. Uh, you know what, let's do that. Let's just graph. Uh, we'll do an absolute load uh, right there. Whoop. Excuse me, we'll keep that one checked and we'll, we'll, do, we'll do that one. And we'll do the calculated load above it uh, to get a comparison of the two. A lot of times the absolute load level uh, is going to be um, more accurate than the calculated load. Both of these are a sign of how well the engine's breathing. And you can see right now, it's at about 25% or so. Um, so now what I want to do is I'm going to hold the brake and I'm going to do a couple of wide open throttle snaps and we're going to see what we get. Ready? Here we go. And we're going to freeze that information. Look at absolute load. That's really telling me what I really want to know here. Um, we're going to take a look at moving that over to where we can get an actual measurement. And I'm going to pick the highest one I got. Line that up at the end. And you can see we're getting about 103% absolute load value. Take remember this number. We're also showing 18.9 psi boost pressure. Normal atmospheric is about 14.7. So we're adding about four PSI of uh, pressure uh, into, that, into that air charge. So we're packing more air in. That's why that breathability is actually a little higher than 100% here. If the results you got result in a 90% or higher VE, then odds are there's nothing wrong with the breathing ability of the engine. So focus your troubleshooting on fuel and ignition. And don't be surprised if you see a late model, high efficiency engine design reaching numbers close to 100%. If these engines are turbocharged or supercharged, you may even get as high as 170%, depending on the amount of boost being applied.
Anything less than 75% indicates a problem. You can remove the intake manifold and visually inspect for carbon, which can be time consuming, or you can use the Autel MV480 borescope to peek inside instead. The MV480 allows you to take both still images and video recordings that you can share with your customer and document what you've found. There's also a micro HDMI port included so that you can expose the image to a much larger screen using any monitor to make the images more easily seen. And finally, when you're done with your repair, you can use the tool again to document your repair success and share that with your customer as well. Another way that you can check for the presence of carbon is by using the scope on the MS919 scan tool. Of course, you can perform this test on any scope that you may own. And uh, you'll need a pressure transducer, something like this one. And we're just going to place that in the same port where we took a look at the uh, valves with the bore scope and then set the scope up. Now the scope setup is going to be a little bit different than the 2020 rule you've heard me talk about in the past. So let's start there. We're going to only be interested in the changes in the vacuum and the intake manifold rather than what the actual measurement is. And of course the transducer can do that for us. So I'm going to eliminate the DC component, the measurement part of it, if you will, and just focus on the changes. And I do that by selecting the AC coupling function on the scope. In terms of voltage, um, again, since I'm using an AC coupling, I don't need a whole lot. So what do you say we start with, oh, 100 millivolts and, uh, and go from there? Um, now we're going to check in the time base. Uh, we're going to leave that where it is. That, that's the second half of the 2020 rule. Uh, that's about uh, what we need to capture the complete cycle of one cylinder, 720 degree crankshaft rotation that is um, at idle. Uh, and now we just have to start the car and see what we get. So here's the pattern that we've got. Uh, it's a little big for this screen. I'm gonna go ahead and tighten this up a little bit so we can see a little better. We're gonna make slight adjustments at the time and voltage divisions to bring that in tighter and we'll add a trigger as well. So let's first go to that. We'll increase the voltage to bring that more into the center of the screen like we have here. And then we're going to increase the time to make that a little tighter pattern like this. Okay, now we can really see something in that pattern. And we'll go ahead and we'll just freeze it right where we are. Here's what I want to point out to you. You can notice that there's a little hashiness, a little interruptions, uh, whatever you want to call it, in the top of these patterns. They should be nice, rounded, and nice and smooth as they make the transition. You can also see that the intake pull, that is the downward side, is not uniform. There's variations there in how much intake pull is being accomplished on each of these cylinders. These are all indications of carbon buildup in the intake tracks. Now we know from the video that we took earlier, it's there, not severe, and that's what the pattern is showing. It's there, but it's not severe. Um, this is the case where I may recommend to the customer to do a chemical cleaning rather than wait for the problem to get worse and require a much more major repair to correct it. A few final notes for you before we go. If you do determine that carbon buildup is the cause of your customer's drivability concern, you'll more than likely have to remove the intake manifold and clean the carbon deposits out manually. Media blasting using special equipment that utilizes pulverized walnut shells works well, but it is time consuming. Don't rely on chemical treatments alone when you're dealing with severe carbon buildup. However, Recommending these treatments every 15,000 miles or so as a preventative measure after you've gotten that carbon out of there is not a bad idea to help minimize or even eliminate the need to perform an involved service again down the road. You'll also want to inspect anything that could be contributing to the excessive carbon buildup. Be sure that you check the factory for any related technical service bulletins that may apply to your customer's situation. And make sure that the crankcase ventilation system is working as it should. Now, if you'd like to know anything more about the diagnostic tools I used in today's videos, I encourage you to visit our friends at www.autel.com. And as always, thanks for watching.